Hello everybody and welcome to this De Morgan Foundation talk, a poetic perspective on Evelyn De Morgan and the Pre-Raphaelites with our guest Elora Sutton, who it's my pleasure to invite um, to speak for the De Morgan Foundation. I know she's been a big fan of Evelyn De Morgan for some time. Uh, Elora is from Hampshire in uh, the UK um, and is a, is a practicing poet. Her poetry has been published in the Poetry Review, Poetry, Birmingham Literature Journal, Interpreter's House and Poetry News, amongst many others. She has won the Mexilio Poetry Competition, the Pre-Raphaelite Society Poetry Competition and the Artlist Art to Poetry Award. She's been a poet in residence at Jane Austen's house and now works there as a creative engagement officer. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome her to the De Morgan today for um, a poetic look at Evelyn De Morgan. Thank you so much, Laura. Hand over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and th thank you for having me. And thank you um, to, to the audience for spending a little bit of your, of your Friday with me um, as I enthuse about two of my favourite things, art and, art and poetry. Um, the plan is to to talk a little bit about the sort of the idea of art and um, poetry or, or art and literature as sort of sister forms and the ways they overlap and their sort of shared ecologies. Um, and then look at the Pre-Raphaelites, uh, especially Evelyn de Morgan, um, you know, the, the light of my life. Um, and I'll sort of discuss how I how I look at her paintings as as a writer and how her paintings might be considered as poems um, in their own right. Um, I want to start, as I think I should probably start all things, uh, by quoting Virginia Woolf. Um, just as a, as a sort of side note, Virginia Woolf's mother, Julia Stephen, was actually a pre-Raphaelite model. Um, she sat for the likes of G.F. Watts and Edward Byrne Jones. Uh, Virginia Woolf's aunt was the photographer, Julia Margaret Cameron. Um, so there's lots of sort of pre-Raphaelite overlaps when you look at Virginia Woolf and, and her family. Uh, Virginia Woolf was, of course, a writer. Her sister, Vanessa Bell, was a successful artist and Wolf herself did, did write a, a bit about art and she certainly got, got inspiration from art as well. In her short story, sort of creative non-fiction essay, uh, Walter Sickert, A Conversation, Wolf says, painting and writing have much to tell each other. They have much in common. She goes on um, to say, it is a very complex business, the mixing and marrying of words that goes on, probably unconsciously, in the poet's mind to feed the reader's eye. The example Wolf gives of a poet feeding the reader's eye is John Keats, who, she says, uses colour lavishly, lusciously, like a Venetian. In the Eve of St Agnes, he paints for lines at a time. If you're unfamiliar with the Eve of St. Agnes, here's a little bit of what Virginia Woolf was talking about. When Madeline, the um, poem's sort of romantic protagonist or love interest, kneels to pray in front of a moonlit stained glass window, Keats vividly describes or paints how the light through the window um, sort of illuminates her. He says, Rose bloom fell on her hands together pressed and on her silver cross, soft amethyst, and on her hair a glory like a saint. She seemed a splendid angel. Keats here is really trying to appeal to that metaphorical eye of the reader's imagination, painting an exquisite jewel toned scene. I don't know about you, but it's a scene I can really see as I read it. I remember the first time I read The Eve of St Agnes. I was almost overwhelmed by this rich feast of imagery. It sort of swam before me, a bit like entering an art gallery for the first time and, and not quite knowing where to look first. This is perhaps why so many of the Pre-Raphaelites drew inspiration from Keats's poems. Uh, indeed, The Eve of St Agnes alone was given the Pre-Raphaelite treatment by the likes of John Everett Millet, which you can see here. Uh, William Holman Hunt and Arthur Hughes. But as well as inspiring artists, Keats was also in turn uh, inspired by art. So one of Keats's most famous poems is Ode on a Grecian Urn. And even if you don't know the poem itself, 
you'll most likely be familiar with the oft quoted and oft debated closing lines. Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. In the ode, Keats meditates and muses on the titular urn, describing the scenes depicted on it, he almost interrogates it until he is able to, to mould it into a metaphor for human mortality. When old age shall this generation waste, he tells the urn, thou shalt remain. Interestingly, Ode on a Grecian Urn wasn't published in a literary periodical like we might expect, but in the Annals of Fine Art in 1820, so it was published in an art magazine. And I think this really embodies the enmeshing of art and poetry, uh, a kind of symbiotic relationship uh, across fertilization and ecology of mutual inspiration and influence. Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn is often given as a prime example of ekphrasis. An ekphrastic poem is a poem that describes or other wise response to a work of art, usually a work of visual art. The Oxford Classical Dictionary defines ekphrasis as the rhetorical description of a work of art. Edward Hirsch expands on this, um, noting that ekphrastic modes address and sometimes challenge the divide between spatial and temporal experience, eye and ear, visual and verbal mediums. So it does let you sort of play with the differences um, in, in the forms. The oldest recorded example of ekphrasis is Homer's description of Achilles' shield in the Iliad. So it's, you know, it's a very old tradition. It dates back to at least the 8th century BC. And it's a mode that has never really faded out of fashion, as demonstrated by my very rudimentary and very, very, very much incomplete timeline. Um, but you sort of get the picture that it has been going on for a long time. Um, so from Homer to Dante to Keats uh, to Frank O'Hara, who worked as a curator at New York's Museum of Modern Art, as well as being one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. Um, poets throughout history have sought inspiration and I think writing advice from visual art. Contemporary poets writing ekphrastic poetry today include Grace Nichols with her 2009 collection, Picasso, I Want My Face Back, which I think is the most fabulous title for a poetry collection. There's Diane Seuss with her 2018 collection, Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl, um, and Lucy Mercer's emblem which was released just last month and is an absolutely fantastic poetry collection i i really really recommend it um but these are just you know a very very select list there are lots of lots of poets out there working ekphrastically increasingly museums and galleries are hosting poets in residence as a as a new way of exploring and interpreting their collections I myself was poet in residence at Jane Austen's house before becoming their creative engagement officer, as, as was mentioned in the um, introduction. I'm currently the poet in residence at Petersfield Museum, uh, where my project this month is responding to their amazing collection of Flora Twart artworks. Um, the Pre-Raphaelite Society has a wonderful poet in residence, um, Sarah Doyle, and they run an annual poetry competition, uh, which I have been fortunate enough to, to win twice. The poet Pascal Petit, whose 2010 collection, What the Water Gave Me, responds to the life and work of Frida Kahlo, says that a good poem is like an art installation. Similarly, the poet, the Roman poet Horace said in his Ars Poetica, ut pictura poesis, as in painting, so in poetry. The number one rule um, for writing poetry that you seem to be, I seem to be told in sort of every, every poetry class I've ever taken uh, is to show, don't tell. So perhaps in that respect, a poem is always striving to be like a painting. Interestingly, I, I think interestingly, the word poetry comes from the Greek word poein, meaning to make, just as one might make a table, a necklace, or yes, a, a painting or a sculpture. 
So poetry was, was seen as a, an act of craft, which is why poets today still talk about poetry as being their craft. Um, it's not just us being pretentious, uh, although it is, it is that a bit as well, I think. Uh, poetry and art, I think, share a lot of the same impulses, a lot of the same techniques, and there is a shared language or at least an overlap of language. For example, um, for my work with Petersfield Museum, um, I was doing some research in, into Flora Twart, and a word that came in, kept coming up in relation to her art was describe. Uh, for example, Alice Monroe Foray, um, as you can see in this quote here, says, every element um, in Flora's work is minutely observed and described. This really jumped out at me and as something quite interesting because description is most usually verbal. Words describe things, right? If I asked you to describe your house to me, you would, I imagine, start talking or typing into the chat box and um, you wouldn't start drawing. But it is true, I think. Uh, a painting is a description of what the artist sees or imagines or what the artist wants the viewer to see. It's a kind of non-verbal description, just like a poem is or can be a description of what the poet sees, feels or imagines or again wants the reader to see or feel. Both art and poetry function as acts of image making and thus of description. It's just that I describe with words rather than with colours and shapes. Furthermore, um, both are, generally speaking, visual modes of expression. A question that's often asked is, what is the difference between prose and poetry? And whilst it is impossible to ever fully answer that question, one popular offering is the way the work looks on a page. A poem is an aesthetic object. Using lineation is an aesthetic choice. Of course, there are also prose poems, but even that is an aesthetic choice, a choice to take up more of that white space on the page. When I am choosing to end or break a line in a poem, or not to end or break a line, I consider several things, sense, sound, breath, and aesthetics. How does the poem look if I break the line here? If the rest of the poem's lines are uniformly short, how does it look? Or what does it mean if I let the line run on? Or does it need to be a prose poem? And um, then there are um, the more overtly visual poetic forms as well, such as concrete poetry, which are poems that are sort of written in, in shapes of different things. Um, or there are erasure poems, which make use of blackouts um, on the page. A poem, I think, occupies the page in the same way that a painting inhabits a gallery wall. When it comes to why do poets write and why do artists, for example, paint, in short, why do, why do people create? I think the answers are usually the same, to communicate, to express and share an experience or feeling, to comprehend, to entertain, to tell us something, to engage us, to enrage us, to make us understand, to make us see. Both are acts of articulation, communication, expression, description, translation. Sometimes they are also acts of protest, of witness, of documentation or memorialization. They come from a desire to speak and remember, to speak and be remembered for speaking. Uh, I think Alain de, de Botton and John Armstrong sum it up pretty well in their book, Art is Therapy. A fugitive and elusive part of our own experience is taken up, edited and returned to us better than it was before so that we feel at last that we know ourselves more clearly. To create is an act of knowing yourself. These shared aims and impulses are perhaps why art or aesthetic movements almost always contain a literary wing or element. 
the Renaissance brought us writing um, from Shakespeare as well as the paintings of Titian. Modernism brought us Gertrude Stein as well as Pablo Picasso. The Romantics counted amongst their number Keats as well as painters like J.M.W. Turner. The Harlem Renaissance brought us Langston Hughes as well as Aaron Douglas. The Pre-Raphaelites, as I'm, I'm sure you are all well aware, were no different. As well as being inspired by poetry, there was quite a lot of it being written by the Pre-Raphaelites and those in their circle. Christina Rossetti, um, who is sat here on the stairs, is perhaps the most famous Pre-Raphaelite poet. Her brother Dante Gabriel Rossetti also wrote poetry, uh, as did his, his muse um, Lizzie Siddle. I first started to really consider ekphrasis in terms of my own practice when I visited the Watts Gallery near Guildford in Surrey. It was International Women's Day 2018, uh, I remember it well. The exhibition was Christina Rossetti, Poetry in Art. Uh, I was relatively unfamiliar with the Pre-Raphaelites at that time. Um, I was unable to imagine how a poet could possibly be the nucleus uh, of exhibition of visual art, or certainly at a, at a gallery dedicated to visual art. It was a gorgeous exhibition, and I still um, really treasure the exhibition catalogue to this day. I've got it on my bedside table, actually. It showed how her poetry had influence and continues to influence artists. To quote from, from that catalogue, she provided for some artists an opportunity to take risks. Rossetti, in turn, was inspired by the art world with poems such as A Portrait and In an Artist's Studio. So even if she's not necessarily directly responding to visual art, although she, she does do that, um, for example, in an artist studio, she certainly borrows the language of, of visual art. So portrait, a study um, and things like that. When I exited the exhibition with these ideas of poetry and art already in my head, I went straight into the room um, that is occupied by the De Morgan collection. Um, and it was just, it was like a, like a revelation. It was like stepping into a jewel box or into the rich colors of a Keats poem. I remember standing on this sort of balcony or landing, um, which is, I've taken this picture from the internet, um, but I believe that this is taken from the, that sort of balcony that looks into the gallery space. Um, but I just remember standing on that balcony and looking down into the gallery thinking, oh my God, <laughs> this is how Aladdin must have felt when he sort of looked into the cave of treasures. I got my phone out and immediately started making notes because I wanted to worm my way inside these paintings. I wanted to articulate them. They said exactly what I wanted to say and I wanted to figure out how to, to transcribe or translate them, to maybe steal from them a little bit. There are many things that appeal to me about Evelyn de Morgan's paintings, of course. Their drama, their rich colours, their sheer beauty and lavishness. I want to dress up like this lady. I think she, she looks fabulous, um, which is perhaps not of the, of the painting, but um, just gorgeous. The people in them and um, their expressions and emotions feel so real. I, want, I wanted to reach in and stroke the fabrics the hair, I wanted to smell the flowers, I wanted to step barefoot onto the grass, I wanted to ascend with the women through, through that mist there, or, or comfort the, the women who sometimes in de Morgan's paintings look, look upset. In short, looking at or experiencing Evelyn de Morgan's paintings was like looking a poem in the face. Evelyn de Morgan, it's the way I strive to write. I felt as Virginia Woolf, to go back to Virginia Woolf again, I felt as Virginia must have done at first seeing a painting by her sister Vanessa Bell called A Conversation. Seeing this painting moved Virginia Woolf to congratulate her sister on being a great short story writer. High praise indeed. On the flip side of the iconic 20th century poet Elizabeth Bishop was very well pleased when a critic described her poems as being like of Willard or sometimes even Vermeer. One day I would love for a critic to maybe describe one of my poems as being an Evelyn de Morgan.
to me, Evelyn de Morgan's paintings are highly successful poems. They are ripe with metaphor. They are always doing more than one thing, just like a good poem must. One of the earliest lessons I was taught as a poet is that a poem should always be more than its subject matter. It should always be more than the sum of its parts. A poem about a flower, for example, is never just a poem about a flower. Just as this painting of a man sort of moping in a garden is not just a painting of a man moping in a garden, it's called a soul in hell. And Evelyn de Morgan is deploying metaphor and symbolism in the same way a poet would to make a comment about human morality and mortality. She is a poet just as much as she is a painter. Take, for example, The Cadence of Autumn. It's one of my absolute favorite paintings. Um, Western art, like Western literature, is read from left to right. So if we read this painting like a poem, I would call each of these gorgeously dressed figures a stanza, or maybe a poem in their own right. And each of their activities is perhaps a metaphor. This is how I personally might read this painting if I were to read it as a poem. So the figure on the left, uh, the first stanza or the first poem in this sequence, if you will, represents the, the, the idea of spring. She is the most useful figure in the painting. She's a little bit dishevelled. She's holding onto her basket of fruits there. I think she looks a bit like she's been at a party or, or a revel all night. Um, but I also think there's something quite anxious about how she's holding herself. The look on her face and um, the way her leg is sort of stepped back a bit there. Perhaps one interpretation or translation of this figure might be a comment on the social anxieties and pressures placed on young girls. Then we have these two most lavishly dressed figures um, representing summer. They appear older and wiser than spring as they work together to gather their rich glut of fruit there. This could perhaps be translated as a metaphor for the power of women working together and supporting and learning from each other, as opposed to the rivalries so often encouraged between beautiful young girls like Spring there. The next figure is again older, and at first glance, she might appear despondent or depressed, but I think she is content. She is sat down, gazing at a flower, she is resting, she's taking it slow, taking the time to appreciate the, the small beauties that's, that are around her. She realizes now that life is fleeting. This could perhaps be a stanza about nature and mindfulness, more relevant now than ever, I think. She could almost be sat at her desk working from home during one of the lockdowns we went through, taking a moment to use a meditation app on her phone or tending to a houseplant which she has managed to nurture into flower for the first time. The final figure in the, in the painting looks older. She almost looks perhaps a little bit like a pale witch. The colour scheme of her dress is almost an inversion of springs. We might even say that it rhymes with the outfit Spring is wearing. Although she is pale and stooped, she doesn't, to me, look like a weak woman. I think her arms are quite strong looking still. She's quite solid. She's not faded or, or she's not withered away. It's almost as if she is enchanting or conjuring those autumn leaves around her. She is of the earth. She is wise and magical. But is she perhaps shunned by her community? Is she othered? It looks like it, she's on, she's on the edges. Perhaps she is a metaphor for the vilification of powerful older women, of wise and strong women. To me, this is perhaps a sequence of feminist poems, a comment on the sleepy town nestled in the background as maybe a microcosm for society as a whole. The cadence of autumn is doing all these different things and it is beautiful whilst it does so, as a good poem aims to be. Paintings like poems are open to interpretation. The artist or poet can't control what the audience thinks in response to their work. 
their intention becomes immaterial in the space of communion between the viewer uh, or reader and the work. The work, be it poem or painting, is completed by its audience. Another of Evelyn de Morgan's particularly poetic paintings is Blindness and Cupidity, Chasing Joy from the City. It even contains a small poem in the bottom right corner. Hunted joy flies through the gate. Blind blindness is left desolate. Cupidity, the city's fate. The hungry hounds insatiate, stays fettered to a sightless mate. And then she has translated this poem with her signature symbolism, a visual figurative language. The peach and gold toned angel is a metaphor for joy, flying away, perhaps never to return. This is on the far right of the painting, the last part we visually read. That eternal departure of joy, the angel flying away, is the closing line of the poem. And it's the, the closing line of a poem that stays with the reader the longest. So this angel flying away is the image that we're left with. It is perhaps the image Evelyn de Morgan wants to leave us thinking on. Joy is beautiful, but it is fleeting and it cannot be gated in with greed and gold. One of the, the many, many things that I really treasure in Evelyn de Morgan's paintings is their psychological interiority. Her people, her characters have intense emotional life. They feel psychologically complete. There is emotional truth beneath the paint, just as there must be beneath the words of a poem. It's what I love about this 1877 oil by de Morgan called Ariadne in Naxos. Ariadne is sat there, barely able to support herself. She is a poem of unrequited love, of grief and despair. Shells surround her like smashed glass and rubble. She looks shipwrecked. The slight flex of her hand though, suggests an inner strength a need to pick herself back up, but not yet knowing how. Her other hand is limp, bereft, empty. But it's her face, to me, that is, is truly heartbreaking. She is a young woman, blaming herself, realising she's made a mistake, that she's been abandoned by, by someone who she thought loved her. Her lips are slightly parted, but there's nothing she can say and nobody she can say it to. Her eye looks almost bruised from crying. It brings to mind for me, G.F. Watts's earlier painting, Found Drowned, a slight echoing perhaps, or, or maybe a rhyming. They both depict abandoned and waterlogged women, but for De Morgan's Ariadne, it is not too late. There is still hope for Ariadne. There's hope in the subtly suggested strength of her flexed hand, the reach of her foot, the glint of her gold crown, which you can see um, very faintly, sort of almost a suggestion of a crown uh, in her hair there. If you're familiar with Greek mythology, um, this crown could even be interpreted as foreshadowing of the crown that will be given to her by her future husband, the god Dionysus, Dionys I can't say it, Dionysus. Dionysus, Dionysus. Don't worry, Ariadne, the right guy is coming. But the right guy isn't just a guy, he is a god. So she, she really does level up from Theseus. Ariadne in Naxos is not a tragic painting. Ariadne is no Juliet. This is a poem of first love and first heartbreak, yes but it's not a poem of tragedy or of hopelessness. This painting is a poem of holding on. It reminds me of the closing line of one of my favorite contemporary poems to the woman crying uncontrollably in the next stool by Kim Adonizio. Listen, I love you, joy is coming. That's what I want to say to Ariadne. That's what I think maybe 
Evelyn de Morgan is saying to us through her depiction of Ariadne, listen, I love you, joy is coming, or rather the, the god of revelries and wine drinking is coming perhaps. This is one of my favourite um, Evelyn de Morgan paintings and one that I found on the de Morgan Foundation website. It's a place I often turn to uh, when I'm suffering from writer's block. So this painting is called The Salutation. It's an oil on board um, and it depicts the scene where the Virgin Mary um, has just been visited by the angel Gabriel. She's just been told she's pregnant with Jesus and she's not really sure if she believes it or not. So she goes to visit her kinswoman, Elizabeth. And in finding that Elizabeth is also pregnant, it, it confirms to Mary that the Archangel Gabriel was telling the truth and that she is pregnant with the son of God. Um, I've never actually seen this painting in person. I've only seen it online, but I've written a poem about it um, called Anne Mary went with haste to Elizabeth. It won the Pre-Raphaelite Society Poetry Competition. Uh, I thought I would read the poem and then explain a little bit about the process behind it. And Mary went with haste to Elizabeth. Neck, shoulder, elbow. Forgive me for touching, but nowadays I have to check. I keep having these dreams where I am an embryo sewn up inside my own body by a seam of white lilies. Oh, you are so real. Moss and plum. I woke up this morning, blue, my head on a gold platter. I walked this far like a candle. Fingers, nose, eyes, tallow down my sides. I walked barefoot under those weird trees. Dirt refused me. Thorns castrated themselves. Sister, is it your arm or a purple mountain? Again, um, one of the things that really attracted me to this painting as a poet was its psychological drama. De Morgan, to me, is almost subverting the biblical story of the Annunciation. Mary doesn't look overjoyed at the prospect of, of the Immaculate Conception. She looks exhausted, I think. She looks tired. She looks condemned. I wanted to write into that. Several of the details from the painting leaped out to me as metaphors or images that I could translate into my poem. For example, I was struck by how clean Mary's feet are, um, despite her long barefoot walk through the dust and dirt that we see in the background. In my poem, this is translated as dirt refused me. So a sort of unnaturalness. I was similarly grabbed by the visual rhyming between Elizabeth's outstretched arm here and the mountains behind um, that you see behind Mary. This gave me the closing line of the poem, is it your arm or a purple mountain? Another um, of Evelyn de Morgan's paintings that I have responded to is the 1906 painting, Demeter, Mourning for Persephone. Again, I thought I'd read the poem and then talk a, talk a little bit about the process behind it. Um, so this poem was originally published uh, by the Canon's Mouth and then Sarah was kind enough to give it a home on the De Morgan Collection website. Demeter Mourning Persephone. Barefoot, I am medieval with grief. You shall have no wheat, no hops. You shall have no oranges. I want to watch the ribs of this land rise. I want this land to reliquary. I want no harvest songs, no other women's daughters dancing, harvest dances, dancing, offering their hearts for fruit in heart shapes and heart colours. 
kisses to grazed knees. I am raised cornfields with grief. Starve, starving. This is one of the most moving of de Morgan's paintings to me. The subject of the painting, the Greek goddess Demeter, is as luxury re luxuriously rendered as we would expect. And she serves as a metaphor. She is a vehicle for the paintings and, and my poems theme, the universal truth of, of grief. Demeter is human in her suffering. Again, we see that vivid psychological interiority that De Morgan describes so well. If you look closely at Demeter's face, she isn't crying. She is past the point of tears, a bit like Ariadne in Ariadne in Naxos. This led me to explore Demeter's emotions, to look at the, the stages of grief. So in my poem, Demeter is vengeful, but this is hiding a desperate urge to protect other women's daughters from offering their hearts for fruit as her own daughter Persephone has done, eating um, a pomegranate so that she stays trapped in the underworld. The line, I want to watch the ribs of this land rise, came from the sharp jutting of the rocks where Demeter is kneeling. The way De Morgan describes them is similar to the sharp drama of a starved, emaciated body in which the ribs rise up sharply, just as these rocks do. This is a psychological landscape, reflecting Demeter's interior emotional landscape. This is landscape as metaphor. Every detail in Demeter mourning for Persephone is working to tell, no, to, to show, to express an emotional truth. In this sense, it is very much a poem. Being a poet, uh, especially a poet with an interest in ekphrasis, does make me quite possibly one of the very worst people to visit an art gallery with. I will stand and stare at the same painting for an exorbitant amount of time. I will take a hundred or so photos of that same painting, zooming in on various minute details that I might want to transplant or translate or steal um, for a poem. Perhaps my biggest sin, though, is that I will stand there in the gallery with my phone out, tapping away into my notes app. Sometimes I am a touch more civilised and bring, will bring a notepad and pen, but usually it is, it is a phone. Paintings give me access to places, experiences, emotions and stories that I haven't necessarily felt or experienced firsthand myself. I can pull from in my writing. For example, I will likely never turn into a tree, but thanks to Evelyn de Morgan's psychological sensitivity, I can empathize and identify with the dryad in this painting. Her emotions, her trappedness, her, her longing and her loneliness and how she holds herself. I might want to write in her voice, or borrow the beautiful purple irises down by, um, by the side here um, as, as a line in, in a poem I might write in the future. Being a poet has really encouraged me to look more closely and more imaginatively at art. When I see a painting now, I ask myself, what can I steal from it? What metaphors and images are there in there that are ripe for the taking? What stories does it tell? What voices are in there whispering through layers of varnish and paint? What, what can't I see? What happens next? What or who is the sitter looking at? What is the painter trying to express? In short, I have become a magpie. Even if a poem isn't written in direct response to a painting, I will often turn to art and quite often, um, pre more often than not, pre-Raphaelite art uh, and the art of Evelyn de Morgan, um, looking for that right image, the right colour, the right phrase, um, the right nugget of writing advice. I thought I would finish off uh, by reading two more of my own pre-Raphaelite ekphrastic poems. 
The first is called The Branding of Elgiva, and it is after the painting Elgiva by Joanna Boyce Wells. Uh, it won the 2019 Pre-Raphaelite Society Poetry Competition. Uh, and the second poem I'll read um, is called The Angel Gabriel Visits Mary in Bedlam, Eki and Ancilla Domini, after Dante Gabriel Rossetti's depiction of the Annunciation, in which his sister Christina Rossetti, the poet that, that I talked about earlier, um, was the model for the Virgin Mary. And that poem uh, won Artlist's Art to Poetry Award. The Branding of Elgiva. There is no landscape, only fragments of bone and her and in an earthy shade of Mary, tarnished gold headband, a shush of chestnut hair, milk, the immolation of dawn. She screams wildfire, smells the hog from her own wedding feast, carved. Her robes are plum colored and unbearable with dew. This is the second poem. It's, it's a little bit longer. It goes, uh, it, it's spread over a couple of slides. Um, and it's a response to Eki and Scylla Domini, The Annunciation by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The angel Gabriel visits Mary in Bedlam, Eki and Scylla Domini. Look at the dove, so wide, a suicide against the wall. Wrap it up in the blue cloth. I've been keeping it unwrinkled for such a purpose. Long blue tongue of heaven. Little feathers, I want to wash my hair. Confession, I sang the dove in. They're going to cut my hair for copper coins. Sacrificial blade of my scalp. He comes in and I know he is flat and naked. His burning ankles gristle of barbed wire. They took my bones away, like the dove. Lighter than air, I want to wash my hair. He holds out a wired jaw of lilies, two starburst and one unbroken, and I tell him, no. Doctor's note, she has been speaking in tongues again. My shift is a grubby, devout face over my legs, my knees, their blue is Luna. He's still there, his broken jaw in the act of mending. His hair is so clean, I can't see the door. It's greased handle. I can miracle wine from my nose. His lilies are so white they are blue. I tell him no and offer him the dove instead. Wrapped up, he smiles. All he wanted was a little broken body, a pale thing, to take all the stains of his mannishness, to char by the sparks of his ankles. He swallows the door after himself. The lilies have some Latin name that cuts my throat to say, open blue window. There's a song my mother sang, do you want to hear it? Thank you so much for listening um, and for, for giving up a little bit of your Friday to, to talk poetry and art with me. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. Um, and I would, of course, be absolutely delighted to, to answer any questions or, or talk about anything, anything further uh, if people, people would like to.
Thank you so very much, Laura. I think um, having your insight into the pictures and thinking about how we might read them poetically, um, it certainly made me notice details of the pictures that I hadn't before. So I'm so grateful to you. Thank you. Did anybody have any questions? Please just use the chat box. Um, you can type your questions in the chat if you do have any questions for Laura. I'll start then, because I have a few. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to know a bit more about your process. If people have been inspired today to maybe look at pictures more poetically themselves, how do you get started? I know you've mentioned your methods of making notes in your phone or in a notebook, but what's what's the process? You know, for someone like me, I've never done anything like that before. Um, and I think it would be a good way to interact. So I was just wondering how you, you know, what's the first the first thing you do if you want to get involved poetically so one of the the things I do um most often when I do an ekphrastic poem is that I will write down a list of questions um so the questions are usually when is when is the painting happening um where is the painting happening who is it what's going on what happens next what what can't you see uh, as well, which I think it can be just as interesting to think about as what what, what you can see. Um, and then I'll write down quite at length my aunt, what I think those answers to those questions are, and just keep keep writing. Um, even when you think you've answered the question, just keep keep going, and some, some, sometimes something subconsciously will will click, and you'll you'll have something. But I think definitely coming up with those questions and sort of interrogating the artwork, um, but also viewing it as a way of enjoying the artwork more. Not, not always thinking, I want to get a poem out at the end of this, but I want to have a further enjoyment of this poem. I want to extend my enjoy painting, sorry. I want to extend my enjoyment of this painting by thinking about it more. Brilliant, thank you. I hope that helps other people as well. Certainly um, think that it's something that I might uh, try and have a go at next time, next time I'm in a gallery. Uh, we don't have any questions for anyone, Laura, but I hope you can see the chat box because there's some absolutely lovely um, comments and feedback coming through um, from people who've said, you know, this has been a sort of really insightful, thought provoking way of, uh, of looking at paintings, which is lovely to hear. Um, any, anyone else, any questions? I love them. Um, the point that Sue McAllister has made in the chat, we'll never know which came first, cave art or verbal poetry. I think that is such an interesting thought to have um, because, you know, they both are sort of ancient, you know, we've, we've well, even ancienter than ancient, because I think it's just that that human impulse to create and, and to share as well. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's been so fun to... To have to have a captive audience to talk art and poetry with too. <laughs> My absolute pleasure. I love the way you set the talk up as well, sort of giving us um, the description of what different poetic types were and how it was used by the pre-Raphaelites and then bringing that right up to the present day with your own poetic practice with the painting. So I'm so grateful. It was a brilliant introduction um, to, uh, to, to your practice, but also that general approach to the interconnectivity between um, paintings and poetry. So thank you, Elora. Thank you to everybody for coming along today for your lovely comments. And um, Elora's actually back next week as well, I think it's worth saying. If you have been inspired to create something poetically in response to paintings, then please do sign up for next week's session as well, because I feel like that's that's a workshop, isn't it, Elora? So that will yes. be more hands-on. Yes, it will, be, um, it will be sort of thinking about how we might respond to art in our own writing. It's perf It's for people who haven't written before as well as people who have it's just going to be nice and chill nice and relaxed um and just ha hopefully having some fun great no i'm very much looking forward to it <laughs> i'll see you there <laughs> thank you bye-bye